Well, hey everyone, welcome to this setup video for the Leica Q3. I did one recently for the Leica Q2 when I started shooting with it sometime last year. I'll link that video in this video's description. If you're a Q2 shooter, that setup is different than this video for the Q3. Uh, I'm gonna throw up uh, a recording of the back of the camera. I wish I could output it via HDMI like I can with my Nikons when I do setup videos, but I'm just recording it with my Nikon Z9 back here. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the back screen of the camera while I'm working with it and which buttons I'm hitting to, to manipulate settings. And we're gonna go through and I'm gonna walk through basically the entire photo shooting menu as well as the entire video shooting menu. Kind of set it up at a base point, including customizing the functions that the different custom buttons access on this camera. Uh, it's, it's got a, more of a depth of capability with each of the custom function buttons than you had with the Q2 but at the same time, it does require you to go through and sort of streamline it to make them really usable. So you're not running through a list of 50 options every time you wanna change what one of them does. So we'll run through all that. I'm gonna assume that you have a familiarity with using the shutter speed dial and that the, the thumb wheel in the back grabs the stops in between each stop of shutter speed. That You can use the aperture dial up front, uh, the aperture uh, ring, and also the manual focus ring, how to unlock it and move it from manual focus to autofocus. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about all that. I did a video uh, at the same time that's releasing as this about what I love about the Q3, about the few things I'd like to see them change either via firmware or with a future update someday, uh, a a as well as accessories that I think for me personally are just critical for using with this camera. So uh, let's dive in. And I, before I jump in, I'm going to I'm gonna talk through the general menu structure and then I'm gonna talk about the power of profiles with this camera. And we have to run through the menu structure and set the whole camera up as kind of a base setting before we tweak and create some profiles to just really quickly jump from one mode of shooting like landscape shooting to another mode of shooting like you know black and white run and gun to another mode of shooting like face detection for portrait work. Uh, so I'm gonna run through how I do all of that uh, and if you're interested, I'll talk at the end about how you can download my settings and apply them in your camera. I, I don't do that for Nikon uh, cameras because they're so much more complicated, but with these cameras, there's a few reasons I'll talk about on the way through this tutorial and as well at the end about why I'm okay with doing that. And I'll provide a link for you all. Um, you can always find links to all the gear that I use, including that link to the download in this video's full description. You click the title or show more, um, but we'll, we'll talk more about that as I dive in. All right, so lighten up the camera here. We're turned on. We're looking at our main screen in photo shooting mode. And if we hit menu, you know, I, I, first we'll talk about control structure a little bit. You know, we've got our menu. We've got our shutter button takes us back into the shooting mode. We've got a function one button over here. There's two buttons now. Instead of the Q2's single button, you've got two function buttons up here. Function button one, I have programmed for ISO. It can do other functions too. I have limited to a few things that make sense for me. I'll show you how I did that. Uh, the function two button, I have set to be a focus lock. When I hit it, it focuses and locks, and then I can move the camera around and shoot, and the shutter speed doesn't affect focusing. It's not exactly a, uh, a back button focus, but it does let you disconnect focusing from the shutter button when you're in autofocus mode. And that, that's a good thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but it also accesses a list of things that, that I want it to do, both in still mode and video mode. They're different, the uh, programmable features. Then there's the thumb wheel button up here in the center of the thumb wheel. Uh, I have that set to be exposure compensation. I can also press and hold it, and there's a list of things. Uh, I'll talk about how to set that up. Uh, and then the center button of the D-pad here, if you press that, I have it set to turn on and off different information displays to get a nice clean you know, view with no distractions or just the basic exposure information or all the exposure information. Um, so you can set that up and then that is programmable to do a number of different things as well. Um, you can have it access just about everything in the camera, but that becomes cumbersome. So I limit it to a different set of options for each of those buttons that make sense to me in a group together. And we'll talk about how to go through and do that. A single press of the play button takes you into image review and you can go in and look through your images and zoom in with the center of the, the, the thumb wheel button and look at your images. We won't go too much into that, except to say, you know, you can hit play, 
There's the last image that I took. The information button is still showing you a clear view or the other information. I did this for a video on what I'm packing for Yellowstone and Moab. Uh, pressing the center button zooms you into 100%, lets you zoom around in the image. You can see where I was focused. You can also back in and out with the thumb wheel. Pressing it again takes you back out. All right, enough. Touch the shutter button, we're back into our shooting mode. If I press the menu button once, it takes me right into either the photo quick settings or the video quick settings and throws me into video mode. I'm gonna stick with photo first. We'll talk about video after we've gone through all the menu. It's a different menu and it's different button customization for photo versus video, remember that. Uh, and, and it's really important to set it all up before you start creating profiles that have little tweaks to them. So you got your basic parameters. Right now we're in automatic uh, uh, shutter speed. Uh, no, shutter speed's at a, well yeah, we're in, we're in automatic mode in that we're in aperture priority because I have a manual uh, aperture dialed in. If I switched into automatic aperture and shutter speed, then we'd be in program mode, right? Now we're in aperture priority. If I take it into a custom shutter speed, we're in manual mode, all right? So just similar to other cameras, but with physical dials. Um, it's choosing auto ISO right now. Uh, I have no exposure compensation built in for that EV right there. And we've got some controls. You can touch these buttons and we can say intelligent autofocus. That's where the camera chooses between whether it should be locking focus on a stationary subject or tracking fo focus on a moving subject. For my general kind of shooting mode, I leave it in intelligence autofocus. You've got your focus, different focus um, area modes, the focus points, and you touch that, you can scroll through them. So you've got a multi-field, that's like an auto area, auto focus, the camera picks um, when, you're, when you're out shooting. There's no fixed point, it's gonna look for something as you can see there. You uh, change that into field or to spot. Spot is a very small little focus point that you can move around. It's this little tiny white square. You place it where you want, you lock focus. It's very, very accurate. I use this in my landscape mode. I'll show you how. If we go into field, field is a square that you can move around and select where you want it to focus. This is a really handy mode. I use it in my standard mode. It's a little quicker to move around, a little more forgiving. You can put it on you know, a person, an animal, and quickly lock focus on them. Uh, oops, that's, let's get back out. We wanna go into zone. Zone is like a group area. For those of you coming from the DSLR days, it's gonna look for subjects in that particular area where you put the group. You can say this quadrant is where I'm looking for a subject. All right. Um, pretty cool. Then you've got tracking. Tracking, you place it on a subject, lock it, and it'll track the subject all over the frame if the subject's moving. You lock the subject by holding the shutter button half down, and it'll track it all over the frame. Uh, and then you've got face, eye, body detection, where it's going to look for eyes, faces, and bodies and lock on them. I tend to like to use that with autofocus continuous. Same thing with tracking, autofocus continuous. But that's for shooting portraits. I, I find I would rather use field or spot for a, for a subject that's moving where I select where they are. Uh, and, and the camera does pretty well with finding that spot. I find that it hesitates a little bit and it really wants to lock an eye and sometimes it won't shoot at that decisive moment in eye detect if you're shooting moving subjects. If you're working with a portrait subject and they're posing for you, it's amazing. It'll lock their eyes perfectly. And I really think of this as a portrait mode, not so much. Uh, a moving subject mode. And then there's animal. So you got human and you got animal. It's mainly for pets, I'm finding. You know, I, I've seen it track a bird and a, and a deer before, but you know, this isn't really a wildlife shooting camera at 28 millimeters in general, although I've used my Q2 to shoot wildlife in Yellowstone when it was very close up, but I digress. So, you know, I, I'm gonna leave it, it doesn't really matter because I'm gonna go into profiles soon here. This is your frame rate. With the Q3, I generally shoot a single frame. I'm timing that shot. Uh, you know, you can go into multiple frames by holding the button down, two frames per second at 14-bit uh, raw files with autofocus, or four frames per second, 14-bit with autofocus, or you can drop to seven, you need seven frames per second, 14-bit files, but no autofocus. It's only gonna autofocus the first shot. That's 
not particularly useful in many situations I can think of. Same thing, nine frames per second, it drops the bit rate. You're not getting as, as, as high a dynamic range and color um, bit depth, just not quite as rich a file and no autofocus uh, or 15 frames per second at that same 12 bit or You've got inter interval shooting, which is for, say, time lapse, where you tell it to take a photo so often based on the parameters you have set, or exposure bracketing, which I use frequently in high contrast scenes and situations. We'll talk about how to set that up in a minute here when we get into the menus. And then we've got what color profile are you working with? Standard, vivid, vivid's kind of like Fuji Velvia of the old day. Natural is a little subdued uh, colors, a little more, uh, a little less saturated. Black and white natural, uh, black and white high contrast, and then you can download some of these Leica looks, and there'll be more of these looks coming out. They work with this camera. I've downloaded a few. My favorites are generally black and white natural and standard. Uh, I tend to do my own work on the raw file and post-production. And then we've got profiles. And this is all in this quick menu. The first menu press takes you into this menu. And the profiles are a custom set of settings. If you go to the default profile, which is always there and unchanging, it puts you to the, all the factory default settings like the camera came out of the box. This is one reason why I don't have a problem sharing my profile settings with all of you. Basically, what I'll do is export my profiles and you can download that profile's little, 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 little computer file put it on your memory card and import the profiles and it'll set it up like mine is, but you'll always have this default profile to go back to, which just sets the camera up like the moment you bought it out of the box. That's always there. And then you've got the potential to load in six different profiles of your own. I've only used five of them. I leave one for custom situations where, you know, maybe I need to do something differently. I have a standard shooting mode, just kind of knock around handheld, walking the streets. Um, I have a black and white mode that just throws me into black and white mode and it also has me shooting a RAW plus a JPEG just because profiles aren't attached to this file when they come into to Lightroom to the RAW file so I, I get the full color file in Lightroom and I want to see what the camera rendered in black and white so I shoot a JPEG at the same time just so I can see for processing and sometimes I love the JPEG and I just work with that. Um, and then you've got landscape and panorama mode. That's a much more manual mode for me with more precision focusing and a grid and it sets me at base ISO, not in auto ISO. Those kinds of things I'd want working in the landscape. Face and eye detect, that's that portrait mode for shooting people that's in eye detect, autofocus and AFC. Uh, and then I've got um, action, which is that tracking mode and suddenly I'm at that four frames per second with autofocus and an uh, AFC, autofocus continuous, where it's tracking moving subjects. So those are all easily accessible just by tapping that in the quick menu. I'm gonna go back to my basic standard settings, all right? Um, well, let me show you something. In the default, what I'm talking about with, I showed you the, the, the options and choices that I have programmed into each button in my profiles. If I were to be in the default mode, which is how it comes out of the box, you'll see the list to go through and find something you want that button to do is onerous. You have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. So, you know, changing it from one thing to another is, is really just onerous when it has this long a list for every one of those buttons. When I go into my standard shooting profile or any of my profiles for that matter, and I go in and I hit that long press of that button to change settings, I've just chosen that those are my settings that I want that button to be able to do. And they're all kind of grouped, you know, in, in, in a similar way. So that's something in the customization that I'll show you as we run through more menu settings. Um, this is your uh, metering. And I tend to work in multi-field a lot. That's the equivalent of Canon or Sony's evaluative or Nikon's matrix. It's a you know, an, an algorithm-based, computerized, intelligent metering system where it's looking through lots and lots of images and determining what type of scene you might be trying to photograph and, and giving you the best possible metering. And I find that Leica worries a little less about highlights than some other brands like, like Canon and Nikon. Um, but it really serves well when you're photographing uh, people and animals and you know plants, things like that. It works on getting the exposure just right for your subject. And the way that the camera deals with overexposed highlights is really beautiful in the raw rendering. So in a lot of cases, I don't worry too much about 
it, it blowing out highlights, but I keep an eye on it um, and I'll show you how I do that. But there's also highlight weighted, which I use pretty frequently. Uh, I always use that when I'm in landscape mode. I don't want to blow the highlights of a sunset and just have pure white in the frame. Center weighted metering um, is the old school sort of style before we had evaluative or matrix or this multi-weighted. And then spot. Spot's obviously right wherever your focus point is. That's the part of the scene that we want to meter for, um, which can be really handy. You picture that scene where you've got, you know, a dark alley with one table with a shaft of light or inside a church of one, one skylight sending a shaft of light down onto the pulpit and you just want the pul pulpit properly focused with that beam of light and everything else black. You need spot metering for that or else the camera is going to try to turn the scene more neutral gray and blow that spot out, particularly in multi-field. White balance. The auto white balance can be, you know, hit or miss with this, but if you shoot raw, it doesn't matter because you can always go in and, and adjust it in post. I frequently just use auto white balance. It's, it's close enough. Uh, what size image are you shooting? A large DNG, a medium that's a smaller resolution file, not all 60 megapixels. I don't know why you do that personally. I think storage is pretty cheap. Small JPEGs, large JPEG plus large DNG. You can go through this whole list. I almost always am either in large JPEG plus large DNG for black and whites, or I'm in just straight up DNG, the raw file. Um, this is for connecting to Leica photos. I'm not sure why they put it in the quick setting menu. I find that, you know, once you're set up and paired with your phone or your tablet, it's quite easy to just do it from the tablet or the phone. So I don't ever use this. And if I could change it out of the quick menu, I would, but you can't and it's there. And then a, a, a ticket into the main menu. Now, when you, if you just hit this button, the menu button once, it takes you to the quick settings. You can go into video by tapping video. We'll stay out of there for a minute. We're going to go through all the photo menus first. But when I press that menu button again, it takes me into my favorites. And you can have up to two pages of favorites that you've chosen. I'll show you how to program what's in this favorites list. This is not the stock favorites that come with the camera. There's, there's two pages of it. I find two pages a little onerous. Um, so instead, I put the things I want on the different function buttons for quick access, and then I put some other things in that I can't do that as easily with or that don't fit into my plans as well in the favorites menu, things I really want quick access to. One is the focusing menu. That's a deep level menu. We'll get to it when we go through the actual pages of the menu. This is a shortcut to that section of the menu. It has a lot of different focus settings and sub menus under that. So focusing is a big one. Gray card. That's really, really cool. All you have to do is throw up a white card in front of your camera and hit the shutter button and it's going to white balance you custom for that gray card and the lighting condition that you have. I use that all the time. I can abort with the center button. Capture assistance. That's do I have my grid active? Do I have highlight little zebra stripes going and blown out highlights? If I turn that on, you'll see it makes a difference. Suddenly you see blinkies on the screen, right? It can be distracting, but it can also be really handy at times. So uh, we'll go back, we'll turn those blinkies back off because they're a little distracting for what we're doing. The level gauge, that's that artificial horizon that goes green when it's level. The histogram, I like seeing the histogram while I'm shooting. I wish it was red, green, and blue, uh, but you know, I digress. So there you go, those are all available. You can always hit the, the left button on the D-pad to go backwards. And you'll notice that if I hit the menu button, it takes me right to the to the quick settings. If I hit it again, it takes me right where I was in the deeper level menus, which is really handy when you're working on, say, something on page four. Display settings. This is another deep level menu that lets you go in. We'll talk about it when we get there. Um, but it's got a whole bunch of controls for both the electronic viewfinder, the amazing electronic viewfinder in this camera, and the uh, LCD that we're working with right now. Brightness, color adjustment, whether you're, which one you're using, all that kind of stuff. Again, the left arrow takes me back. Format your memory card. I always want quick access to that when I'm done offloading images. Um, main menu. So that you can you can go to that main menu and click it, or you know we could be back in favor. You just hit the menu button. It takes you to the next page. Wherever you happen to be, it takes you to the next page. So the first menu item on page one is drive mode. It's all the same things that we had in the quick menu. I, I never go to it here because it's in the quick menu. Self timer. You can turn your self timer on and you can tell it whether you want it to be two seconds or 12 seconds, all right? Um, and that I have programmed to one of the function buttons I'll show you. Focusing, that's that deep level menu that I said we'd come back to look at. So right now you've got your focus mode, that's on the quick setting menu. 
intelligent autofocus or autofocus lock single servo or autofocus continuous for moving subjects. Your, your AF mode, that, that area mode, are we in multi-field, are we in field, are we in spot, are we in zone, are we tracking eye and face detection, that stuff. Again, that's also in your quick setting menu. Whether or not your autofocus assist lamp is on. I like how this camera doesn't tell people when it's shooting. It's dead near silent, particularly with the electronic shutter and the sound turned off. Uh, and without the lamp on, I leave it off unless you absolutely need it. You're working in a dark room situation and it's not gonna bug anyone. Most of the time I, I turn this off. I almost never turn it on. Focus assist, that's all, whether when you're doing manual focus and you unlock that focus ring and start focusing, it zooms in to 100% on the place where your focus point is in the frame. I love that, I leave that turned on. Whether what color your focus peaking is turned on and what your focus peaking sensitivity is. I use red and medium works great for me, that's my choice. Touch autofocus, this is another menu of touch autofocus options. So you can touch the screen to focus on the, on the back LCD. Let's say you're set up on a tripod doing landscape, sometimes that's just great. Um, or you can touch to autofocus and release, which early on when that came out with my Nikon cameras, I thought, why would I ever use that? And then I got in a situation where I was manually focus stacking on the tripod in the Grand Tetons, and I realized if you touch the closest subject at f11 and it snaps a shot, you touch something in the mid-ground, it focuses and snaps a shot. You touch the mountain range in the background, it focuses and snaps a shot. It's as simple as just tapping the LCD with a touch-sensitive glove in cold weather. Pretty slick. So sometimes I do use that. Uh, right now I just have it to touch to autofocus. You can turn that off really easily too. All right, we go left to get out of there. And what happens if you touch the back screen while you're looking through the viewfinder? If you've got your eye to the viewfinder, you're holding the camera up and you move your thumb over and start touching the screen. I love that function in some cameras, but with the Leica, I find that my cheek and my nose bump and change the autofocus point when I don't want it to, just because there's no distance from the back LCD uh, to keep my face away from the, from the, from the uh, back LCD panel. The EVF and the LCD are so close and in the same plane, my face bumps into the LCD pretty frequently. And so what I wind up doing is saying AF quick setting only. What does that mean? What that means is that if I'm running around here and I've got my autofocus point down there, but then I'm looking through the LCD and I double tap the screen, quick double tap, it, oops, it recenters my point. It's supposed to. It does work, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Did I turn it off? Let's see. If we hit it again, we should go right into focusing, go down to quick AF, quick setting only. All right, so we're here and I double tap. I don't know why it's not working. It does work. Uh, oh, it's locked. I think that's what's going on. So if I double tap, there, it quick set it. All right. The idea is you're working in the viewfinder and suddenly you want to get to the center focus point. If you just double tap the screen with your thumb quick, even though down in the corner, it'll, it'll center the autofocus point. It works. I don't know why it wasn't doing it with my finger up to the screen. Maybe you have to have your eye up to it. But you get the point. You, you bring it over here, then you double tap and it brings it right back to center. All right, that's the end of the focus. Oh no, autofocus tracking start position. That's only when we're in the autofocus mode, that area mode that's tracking. Um, do you want it to start where you last were, where the subject left the frame, or, or where you had set the tracking point to begin with looking for your subject or just in the center? With this camera, I just tend to use center um, when I'm photographing moving subjects with tracking. It's kind of rare I do that with this camera anyway. Um, but you could use, the, the two that make the most sense to me is recall. Last position, if you think about it, if you're tracking a subject and then they go out of frame to the left, it would leave your tracking point all the way over and say the top left corner if they left that part of the frame. If you were picking up subjects, say a race car coming into the frame from the top right, last position or, or recall would make sense. You set the point up there in the top right, and then you know when when you let go of tracking the subject, it flashes back and it's ready to go again at the top right where you had originally manually put that point. Um, center is just easy to use uh, for me, generally center, but you can always go in and change it. Again, I have this focusing menu in the favorites menu, so it's easy to get to at any time. All right, we'll hit menu, we go left, 
And we're out of here. And then the gray card we talked about already. You can just go into that. Boom. You can set your white balance to custom just by pressing the shutter button with a gray card filling that little square. Center button aborts. Capture assistance we talked about. That's the grid, the clipping zebras, the level gauge, the histogram. Display settings. That's another deep level. We talked about it. This is in the favorites. You can tell it that you want to only use the LCD, you only want to use the EVF, you only you want to automatically choose based on whether your eye is up to the L, to the EVF or not, or EVF extended. EVF extended um, is what I do a lot with my Nikon's, but it, it doesn't work quite as well with the Leica for me. Um, what that does is it, it, it tends to, if, if you take your eye away from the viewfinder, the the back panel doesn't automatically light up. The LCD doesn't light up with whatever you're viewing uh, in the scene. Instead, you're going to shoot only with the viewfinder and you get to the menus and playback in the LCD. But I find that there's a lag when you hit play, when your eyes away from the viewfinder in EVF extended with this camera. And, and maybe I'll test it again when they do some firmware. But there's a lag and then I wind up pressing play more than once and I'm not sure. It just it isn't as good as I want it to be, so I just stick with auto. Um, I guess if I was really, really being stingy with batteries and I didn't want the, the LCD working, I'd be more concerned. But because this has USB-C charging, which we're doing right now, I've got a battery bank connected to it while we're doing this video and it's actually charging the battery as it's running, you know, there's no reason not to just connect a USB-C battery bank to the camera in the bag. And so power is way less of an issue with the Q3 than it was with the Q2 since you have USB-C charging and it can be charging in your backpack while you're not shooting. All right, eye sensor sensitivity. How high is it? I leave it at high. You have several choices. You can have lower high. Um, LCD brightness, you can go ahead and set it. I tried auto. It was a little dark for me in the LCD. So I leave it set over about, you know, a click two clicks from all the way bright. But at night, I might want to change that for say a night shoot so it's not nearly as bright. You can adjust the color if you want. I'm not going to do that, you know, left, right, up, down, green to uh, magenta and you know, cyan to yellow, so blue to yellow. So basically white balance and tilt or tint. Um, let's hit menu to get out of there. Back into display settings. Oh, and then um, the EVF brightness you have to do in the EVF, I can't really show it to you, but it's the same as the LCD brightness. While you're looking through it, you can set the brightness, and while you're looking through it, you can set the color adjustment. And then the EVF frame rate. This comes stock at 60 frames per second, and I think that saves a little bit of battery performance, but it looks so much greater at 120 frames per second. I leave it at 120 frames per second. That's a recommended change. Set that to 120 frames per second. Um, all right, so back in out of there. You can format your memory card. We're not going to do that right now. I got some pictures on here, but if you wanted to, you just hit it. We'll say no, but you could say yes. Um, oh, look at that. We're in the... <laughs> That's why this is happening. I, I dove into my uh, favorites menu. Okay, so that was the focusing menu. Um, we went through all that. We'll come down to exposure metering. That's just the choices between spot, center weighted, highlight weighted, multi-field. All right. Uh, we'll go through exposure compensation. That you can just set the exposure compensation. I like to do that with the wheel, so I never really go into this menu to do that. Um, ISO, you can set the ISO. I like to do that with my button. If I hit it, boom, you can make a choice from all of these, um, including auto ISO. I'll hit the menu button. If I hit the menu button again, we go into page two. Page two gives us some auto ISO settings. Now, this lets us set a limit. I, you know, this camera does really well at high ISO, but I still prefer to limit it to about 6400 unless there's a need to go higher. I keep this setting easily accessible on the same button that controls ISO, the same custom settings button, so I can easily jump in here. I let the camera choose the shutter speed limit for auto, auto ISO purposes. Um, I can always manually control my shutter if I want really easily with the dial up here. I can come down to 15 and hold really carefully and still get a nice sharp shot. Um, probably even an eighth if I'm being really careful. Um, so your maximum ISO with flash and shutter speed with flash, you can set those limits too. Um, it's, that can be handy if you're a person who works with flash and this camera's pretty cool with flash with its leaf shutter and its high flash sync speed. 
white balance, you can set your white balance. Right now we're in the gray card, uh, but we could jump, we could do the gray card adjustment. You know, I could put my hand out here and use it as like a gray card. It's probably not gonna work though. Yeah. Um, you could also run up and we could put it back in auto. Boom. File format. That's the same we were doing before DNG or DNG plus JPEG or JPEG. We're going to run DNG. What's the raw resolution? Uh, very large is 60 megapixels, medium is 36, small is 18. I'm going to stick with large. What if you get a photo you just love and you want to print big, but you were shooting it at smaller resolution? JPEG settings. You can set your JPEG resolution, same kind of thing. You can set noise reduction standards. What's your film style? You know, the standard or vivid or natural. Uh, the Leica looks that you've downloaded to your camera, which are easy to do from the app, from the Leica Photos app. Uh, intelligent dynamic range. That just boosts shadows a little bit in JPEGs. It's not gonna be applied to RAW files, but it's applied to JPEGs and videos. And Nike does a really nice job with it. I just leave it generally set at auto, the camera chooses for JPEGs. And I love the way JPEGs look out of this camera, so auto seems to be working great. Um, what scene mode are you in? This is an interesting one. So you can choose to have the cameras make settings for you for portraits or sports or night or landscape. For me, I'd rather just use manual mode or aperture priority mode. So I stick with that program aperture shutter priority manual. Um, but, you know, I'm sure some people use that. We'll hit menu again. Uh, you've got whether or not optical image stabilization is turned off, on, or in auto. Uh, I have an easy access to that on the buttons, should you need, but I really never turn it off. I just leave it on auto. Uh, the camera does a great job choosing if it needs to be turned off, say you're on the tripod, slow shutter or faster shutter speeds. Photo aspect ratio, I just shoot the, the, the sensor's aspect ratio. I don't see any need to crop in on it. So 3-2 is its native ratio. You get all 60 megapixels that way. Perspective control, this is a crazy, crazy thing uh, with the camera. And, and it, it literally, when you turn it on and then you look at the world, you know, if you were to tilt down, if I took this off for a second, let's see if you can see what I'm doing. I'm gonna you'll see that that crazy square this is great for if you're shooting a building you know and you don't want to get that warped kind of pyramidal look it'll do perspective control it's going to create an image from that white square inset so you get a preview of what your actual image is going to look like with the perspective control active it's pretty crazy i'm finding it interesting i don't use it a lot but in architecture it's pretty stellar. And you see how that worked? If I, if I came out and showed you what was going on through the lens, we're in shooting mode, and then I hit the menu button, it takes me to the quick settings, and I hit it again, it takes us right to the favorites menu. I hit it again, it takes us wherever we were deep into the menu. So page three, perspective control. Let's turn that back off. Shutter type. Do you want a mechanical shutter? Do you want electronic shutter, which can go way faster than the manual shutter? Or do you want a hybrid where the camera chooses? I say hybrid where the camera chooses. That, that has been really sweet for me. You can go up into the, the small fractions of thousandths of a second down to 120 seconds. Uh, the hybrid mode works great. Flash settings, I'm not gonna go too deep into this. You have several different, whether it's on, auto, slow synced, you've got flash exposure compensation if you're doing through the lens metering with a Leica compatible flash. Where are you gonna put the flash if you're doing a long exposure? I usually like it at the end of the exposure so you see blurred motion going to the subject. You feel where they came from and where they wound up at the end. Um, so for that kind of creative work with flash, nice, nice menu there. Exposure preview. Do you wanna see the effects of your exposure in all of your auto modes plus manual or just in all of your auto modes. I like to see the effects of my exposure. Oops, I just went to scene mode. Hold on, let me come back. Uh, oh, I went back to the, that, that happens. If you hit the back arrow too many times, it takes you to the previous page in the menu. Let's go back to where we were by hitting the menu button, it takes us to page three. Go to the right and I'm gonna choose for it to be include manual. So not including manual, including manual. If I hit the left arrow, it would take me back to page two. See how that worked? So I'm gonna hit menu again, gets me back to page three. We're done with page three. I'll hit menu again, take us to page four. Auto review, I turn that off. Auto review is when you take the picture and then for a second you're presented with the image you just took either in the EVF or on the back panel. 
that just gets in the way for me taking the next picture. I can hit the play button if I want to see it. Long exposure noise reduction, you can turn it on or off. I leave it turned on in general, but there are some times, say I'm doing a, a long exposure time lapse, where that gap for the noise reduction uh, will interfere with getting the next shot so that there's not sort of a, a, you know, a, a stuttery effect in the time lapse. Um, there's times where you want to turn it off. It's just going to take too long. You're doing 120 second exposure and you don't want it to take 240 seconds. What happens with long exposure noise reduction is you're doing a longer exposure. The camera takes the picture, then it closes its mechanical shutter or it turns the sensor off and it exposes the sensor for the same amount of time, the same humidity and same atmospheric conditions and notes if there's any dead pixels under the circumstances and then it erases that out of the underlying issue, image. It saves you a lot of time in post-production with particularly night and Milky Way images, which this camera does a nice job with. There's a little coma in the corners wide open, but it does a, a pretty good job. Okay, customized control. This is a deep menu and we're gonna come back to it. We're gonna come back to this at the end. This is how we set up what's in the favorites menu, what's on function button one, function button two, the center button, the thumb wheel button. Um, and how the thumb wheel button operates. So we're, we're going to come back to that when the whole menu is set up because we want everything that we set up in the menu to get locked into these custom controls. All right. Uh, digital zoom. That's where you could choose whether you're at a 28 millimeter frame line, 35 millimeter frame line, 50 millimeter frame line. It's like digital cropping. If you're shooting raw, you still get the full frame raw file. Uh, but if you're shooting a JPEG, it's going to give you the JPEG of that, that crop. Uh, and it crops into the megapixels of the camera. So you're going to get less resolution with this. But it, it's a nice framing device. It doesn't actually show you the image bigger like some cameras would. So if I chose a 50 millimeter crop and then we look at it, you'll see it gives me this white frame line in the middle of my LCD. And, and that's the image I would get shooting a JPEG. If I get, open the DNG in Lightroom or Photoshop, it's going to show me that crop, but if I hit the crop tool, it shows me the whole thing, and I can, I can recover all the rest of the sensor's data, so it doesn't actually crop into the raw file. Um, so we're going to hit menu once, twice to go to favorites, three times to get back to where we just were, and set it back to the full 28 millimeter sensor. User profiles. This is where we set up what profile are we using, and there's that user six I haven't used yet. And we can manage profiles to save profiles, rename profiles, delete profiles, export profiles, like I'm willing to share with all of you, and import profiles, which is what you would do to get the profiles that I share. We'll set this up as soon as we go through the button customization. So this, we're gonna come back to user profiles and custom control on page four when we get through the rest of the menu. Capture assistance. We went through this. It's on the favorites page. I kind of accidentally went through it in the beginning of this, but it's where you turn on and off the grid. Oops. We turn on and off the grid or the clipping zebra lines, those flashies, the level, the histogram, all that stuff. Uh, so if I go back, it takes me back out. And that's the end of page four. So I'll hit menu again to get to page five or I could scroll off the bottom, actually. If I go to, the, to page four and we're in the bottom, if I hit the down arrow, it also takes me to the top item on page five. It just scrolls into the next menu. But the menu button's how I generally navigate page to page. Left button, menu button, or sort of left and right. Play mode setup. So whether, if you shoot a burst, they show up as a group. So let's say you shot 30 frames bah, 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 of your grandchild running towards you. It would, instead of showing you all 30 that you have to flip through, it would show you the first one and you could, uh, you'd could you see that there are 30 frames in there and you could hit the play button and go in and review them. It lets you move through bursts quicker. Um, whether or not you see the clipping blinkies in your images if there's highlights blown out and whether you see the histogram in your images when you hit go into playback with the play button. I generally leave the group display and the histogram off but the clipping on and the clipping turned off. It's a little distracting again for me. Display settings. We went through all this. This was in my favorites menu in the beginning, but it's that, you know, setting up whether you're using the EVF or the LCD or automatically swapping between the two or prioritizing the EVF and how to set the eye sensor sensitivity and the LCD brightness and color and the EVF brightness and color. That's all in there. Your Leica Photos app. This is where you're going. You can choose whether you want it to be in eco mode to save battery or performance mode. Because again, this thing has USB-C charging. I generally use performance mode. Um, and you can pair it. Like right now, you could, you could get in there and 
pair it. So I'm gonna cancel that. Um, it's already paired to my Google Pixel uh, 7 Pro and to my Samsung tablet. You can pair it with your iPhone or your iPad easily. You can delete things that are paired. You can see my Pixel 7 Pro. I still need to pair it to my tablet. I haven't done that. It was paired to my Q2. Going back out of there, um, you can format your memory card. I showed you that in the quick menu, really easy to do. I like that in the quick, the favorites menu um, so that you don't have to go hunting for it on page five. Camera settings, there's a lot going on here. You can change the file name if you want. Queue is fine with me. That lets me know right off the bat it came out of the queue with numbers. You can reset your image numbering if you want. I don't wanna do that right now. You can turn on a power saving mode. You can go into your power saving settings. I have it automatically power the whole camera down if it's not being used for two minutes and turn off the displays after one minute. Um, you know, generally I just flip the switch when I'm running around with it. It's so easy. The switch is right by the shutter button and it's a simple, nice mechanical switch. Acoustical signal. Does your, do you want your camera to make noise? I do not. I set the volume to low. That's as low as it goes. And then I turn off every possible sound it would make. I like it to be dead silent. Um, I heard a great joke from someone who went to one of the Leica stores and heard a, a little lecture by, by one of the, uh, the Leica ambassadors who said the only sound that your Q camera should make is the sound of the original lens cap hitting the ground when it falls off, which again is why in my accessories I recommend a better aftermarket lens cap. USB-C, USB charging, we're using that right now. You can turn it off, I don't know why you would, um, but I'm leaving it turned on, it's just an on off. Um, USB mode, what mode do you want it to be in when you plug into something? Um, there's an Apple setting, there's a select on connection. I just use mass storage. That's how I actually, because I use the Leica grip right now, uh, I don't even have access to my memory card easily or battery. I charge and download images via USB-C through this simple port on the side. Um, so the minute I plug it into either my PC or my Mac Studio, boom. It pops up as a drive, turn on the camera, it sees like a Q3, I can import the files to Lightroom, it's fast over USB 3 or USB-C, it's pretty great. Uh, so we'll, we've got a few more settings, the wireless um, network, you can go in and change your network settings and what your passwords and things like that are. Um, you can set your date and time. That also can be set by connection with your Leica Photos app directly from your phone. You can do some pixel mapping. Uh, you can set that to, if you're seeing dead pixels like we talked about with long exposure noise reduction, over time a 60 megapixel sensor has 60 million pixels. So you know maybe one of them goes a little haywire. Pixel mapping will, 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 will mask that out of your images. Um, it's the thing that all cameras do. So if you need to do it, that'll do it. I think the camera occasionally goes in and does that by itself. So that's all the camera settings menu. Camera information, that just has a bunch of details about what firmware are you using. You can go in and update firmware if you have a new firmware installed. You can also do that from the Leica Photos app. That worked great for me for 1.2. Um, you, you know, what's your address, licensing information, regulatory information, copyright information. I do add copyright information. I turn that on. I write all rights reserved and my name as the artist. So that's appended to the metadata of every single file. I think that's really, really handy. This is all just stuff that's about the camera. Um, so let's get out of there. And then we have our final page six. I'll hit the menu button. What language are you using? And if you want to reset the camera completely to factory defaults. So let's not do that. Let's avoid doing that. Okay. That's, that's definitely not something we need to do after we've gone through the work of setting it all up. But if you had some massive problem, you know, export your, your profiles and then you can reset the camera. You could re-import your profiles. Okay. So, we talked about going to page four. I'm gonna go backwards with the back arrow to page four. And first let's customize controls and then let's set up, well then we'll go through the video menus <laughs> really, really fast, very quickly go through the video menus. So we're gonna customize controls. And the first thing we do is we can edit favorites. And, and when you go to the right, what that gives you is a list of all the things that could be in favorites, okay? And you'd either turn them off or on. So you can go through this whole list. And like I said, you can have two pages if you want. I prefer one page. So I have focusing turned on. Nothing's turned on until gray cards turned on. Nothing's turned on until still going. Display settings is turned on. 
and format memory card is turned on. So that when we go in and I hit my menu, those are the settings in my favorites. That's how I set that up, all right? Same thing is true of, under customized control, your favorite your function button number one. So in my function button number one, I have, it's the same system here. It's gonna be the same for all of them, which is gonna make us a little faster at doing this. First one I have is ISO, then auto ISO settings. Boom, 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 boom. Then I, intelligent dynamic range settings, then optical image stabilization. You get the idea. You run through and you turn on the ones that you want and you turn off the ones that you don't wanna to have to scroll through to get in between all of those. And so you can set that up for your function one button, for your function two button, for your center button, all right? And for your thumb wheel button. That's this button up on the top right. And let me show you what I have set in each of mine. You can download my profile and automatically get those, but I have it set for ISO on the function one button, the one further to the left at the top. And that's what I leave turned on and active. So that if I touch that button, I'm adjusting my ISO. So touch it and it's, auto, it's, it's from auto ISO to what ISO do I wanna use. If I long press it and I choose instead to be auto ISO settings, then if I press it, I get to go in and change that maximum ISO that easily. I could change it up to 100,000 if I wanted, right? I could hit that and say, let's make it all the way up to 100,000. Boom, all right? And now when I go back in here, auto, if I go into ISO again and I choose auto, it's going to let the camera run all the way to 100,000. I don't necessarily want that, but that's how it's set up right now. And the beauty of these Profiles are that if you're messing around with a profile, customizing it, say you go in and change the ISO settings and everything, it's gonna remember what you did within that profile. Say you're in your standard shooting profile. You can turn the camera off, turn it on, put batteries in, take them out. But the minute you go to another profile and come back to that profile, it'll be whatever it was when you saved the profile. We'll talk about that in a minute. But how these custom settings buttons work is literally a long press lets you choose what function that button performs. And I leave it on ISO. I would go back into it. So I can change my intelligent dynamic range. I can turn optical image stabilization on and off. I can turn long exposure noise reduction on and off all from that button, but I'll leave it on ISO. My, my function two button, the one just to the right of it, I have set to be autofocus lock. If I hit, I put my focus point on the subject that's important to me, it's a static subject, it's not moving, the camera's not moving, I can press that button, it'll autofocus on that static subject, lock, in whatever autofocus mode I'm in, it could be spot, or it could be field, or it could be face, it could be whatever, it'll lock, and then I can recompose and hit the shutter button, and it won't affect that locked focus at all, and, and it'll be a solid green point until I hit it again, and it goes back to white, and you can lock it either with the half press of the shutter or by hitting that focus lock again. And you can set that to be auto exposure lock, or you can set it to be auto focus lock plus auto exposure lock. These are the settings I've chosen to have active in there. Just auto focus lock, which is my favorite. And you can turn the AF assist lamp on in here if you want to. These are all sort of autofocus related. Uh, and I can turn focus peaking off if it's somehow annoying me when I'm manually focusing or change its settings. If I was to choose that, hit that button, I could choose what color, it's actually just what color focus peaking is, or off. I can turn it off or I can turn it on red, all right, which is where I like it. Hold the button down again and jump back into my favored autofocus lock position for that button. My thumb wheel or my my uh, my my thumb wheel button, I have set to be exposure compensation. You know, if I'm shooting and I touch that, I can just easily dial in exposure compensation. All right, but options with it that I can change are interval shooting, exposure bracketing, self timer, and flash settings. We haven't even gone into interval shooting, but when I set this up and I say interval shooting, well, all of a sudden that opens up a whole new menu. It says uh, how many frames do you want to shoot? I could tell it I want uh, to go, I want it just to be 240 frames for a 24 frame per second, 10 second time lapse. 240 frames, 24 frames a second, that's 10 seconds of time lapse. I can tell it I want the interval to be two seconds and you can tell it I want it to wait so long before it starts. Then when you hit the shutter button, you're suddenly no longer in single frame mode. If you were to hit your menu button and look at your drive mode, you're in interval shooting mode and you've set the parameters with that menu. We'll jump back into single frame shooting. 
so that's one thing you can do with that, with that button. If we long press it again, you've got exposure bracketing. Now I press it and I get into my exposure bracketing menu where I can set up exposure bracketing. Do I want, three, do I want to do five frames, three frames? Generally, I do three frames. How many stops apart do I want it to be? Do I want it to be three exposure values? You can go by thirds of a stop, all right? I like three exposure values. This camera has so much ability to capture highlight and shadows, such broad dynamic range that three stops apart is like moving these wide goalposts just a little bit. You know, you don't need to capture a stop apart or a third of a stop apart. Three stops apart still smoothly allows you to blend high contrast images into a beautiful natural looking HDR image. I don't use graduated neutral density filters at all anymore. When I shoot high contrast, I throw it into bracketing mode, I shoot three frames and I, I bracket them three stops apart. One on the meter, one three stops over, one three stops under. I look at the histogram if I'm a little overexposed still. I'll underexpose by a stop and then run that same three burst bracket again. You can build in a little exposure compensation if you want. If you're finding you frequently need to build in a little, you can do that. Uh, you can automatic means that when you push the button, it fires all three frames at once. I, I love that. So you just touch the button, bap, bap, bap. I can handhold and do you know sunset shots bracketed and blend them in Lightroom beautifully. In an extreme high contrast situation, like an eclipse shoot, maybe you do five. And that way you're shooting on the meter, three stops over, six stops over, three stops under, six stops under. That's a lot of dynamic range expansion. All right. But again, you know, we've set that up. Now when I go and I hit my quick menu, we're in exposure bracketing. Let's run it back into single and turn that off. But you can set the parameters with that button. Now that button, if I press it again, is going to be exposure bracketing unless I long press it and put it back where I want, which is exposure compensation. The other option I have in there, the other options are self timer. Self timer takes you into that menu that I showed you earlier. You touch it, hit it, and you can choose whether the self timer is at two seconds or 12 seconds or off. Um, all right, so you know by turning it off, I think, nope, it put us into exposure bracketing again. Now let's put it in single frame, boom, all right. And then if I hit the button, we can long press this button one more time. You get exposure compensation and you got those flash settings that we looked at earlier. So those are, I leave it on exposure compensation, but those are the options I have on the thumb wheel button. Same thing, center button, I have it set right now to just cycle through the display options. Clear, so all I see is the image that I'm shooting. The Half of my exposure data that's the most important, the ISO, the aperture, exposure compensation, shutter speed, uh, and the histogram and, and level if you have that turned on. Press it again, I get all kinds of settings up at the top. What are we shooting? Large DNG, what's the, what's the uh, metering mode? You know, what's the white balance? All that kind of stuff. Battery, what's my battery life? Ooh, I'm plugged into USB. You can see the little symbol there beside the battery. So that's what I have programmed to be my standard. I can long press it. I have digital zoom. I could hit that and switch whether, you know, if I, if I turn, if I made that the active button, now when I press it, it's going to throw up the frame lines and cycle between them. 75 millimeter, 90 millimeter, back to 28, 35, 50, 75, 90, back. All right, long press it again. Say no, what I really want is that toggle information levels that we have before. But we also have the touch autofocus controls, perspective control, that cool thing for shooting buildings and not having the disappearing lines that converge on a tall building. The clipping and zebra controls, you know, whether, whether we're seeing uh, highlights with zebras or not. So I'm gonna leave it at toggle info displays. That's all the custom button settings, all right? If I hit menu three times again, it takes us back to where we were in customized control. We've gone through what all those settings were. For example, center button, you see I have toggle info levels on. I, everything else is off until we get down to the touch AIF. You get the idea. I'm back out of there. Thumb wheel button. Um, in, Thumb wheel button in photo and video. I have it turned off. Uh, oh yeah, oh, thumb wheel, uh, that's just the settings for the thumb wheel button. That again, same thing we just did. That's the one where I have interval shooting turned on and all the others. But the wheel assignment, that's what I thought we were looking at. That's the last thing in this. 
you've got whether it's just always exposure compensation, always ISO, or automatic. And I like automatic. And the reason I like automatic is that when I'm working with manual shutter controls, the, the shutter dial at the top only has full stops. And the minute I flip into manual shutter control, so now all of a sudden I've gone to one second, I can get to an eighth of a second, a sixth of a second, it, I'd have to flip to go to a half a second to the next stop on the dial. But if I come back to one second, I can scroll all the way down, watch this, clear down to 120 seconds of exposure just using the thumb wheel. The thumb wheel sets up things that make sense depending on what mode you're shooting in. So I let the camera make that decision. In general, when you're in aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode, it's exposure compensation. You can see it's doing exposure compensation right now. You can see my histogram moving and you can see the exposure guide moving. Now I'm a stop over exposed, now I'm back on the meter. Um, so by default, it's exposure compensation and I can always make it exposure compensation by pushing that button and suddenly now, it, whatever other mode it happened to be in, it's going to go into exposure compensation. All right, so that's my general setup. I leave that in auto, right? So the last thing we have to talk about um, quickly is, before we go in and set up profiles and save the profiles into this camera, is the video mode. And I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of depth with video. You know, I think people that are into video, they generally know what's up, what's going on. Um, you know, let's say I, I was more in a realistic video mode. I'm going to shoot at uh, 24 frames a second. So for a, uh, for a, um, for a uh, um, 180 degree shutter rule, I'd be shooting at about a 50th of a second. Uh, and, and in this case, so, so hitting the menu, hitting the video button, we can change our exposure parameters both through our dials and through touching the button and controlling it. You know, you can set your ISO. Um, you've got a lot of the same quick settings, the, in what autofocus mode you're, what, whether you're in uh, autofocus single servo continuous or intelligent autofocus. Um, you've got whether what what type of autofocus if you're doing autofocus i tend to do video and manual with this camera manual focus so just by opening that ring and manually focusing it kind of obviates all this if, do you have gain on your microphone i have left it at zero one thing this camera lacks is an external mic input hopefully they will make that possible via hdmi or usb-c in the not so distant future It'd be better if it's hdmi and that way you don't burn your usb-c port um, for, for charging the camera. You know, again, what picture mode are you in? I would go either standard or natural. Um, and you've got your profiles, the same profiles that you're going to save for photo shooting, save for video shooting. So you kind of want to set up your, your video options before you save the profiles or else you'd have to do it for each separate profile. Um, you got your, your, your same kind of metering. Do you're using highlight weighted or multi field? Oops. I tapped the wrong thing there. Let me hit that again. Are you using multi-field or highlight weighted, for example? Your white balance, you generally want to set a white balance. You don't want it changing mid-movie. I've got it in cloudy right now. You could set it with the gray card if you wanted, just like we talked about. What is your, uh, your choice of video file? I like movie. I like 4K. I like 24 frames per second at 400 megabytes per second. That's a really, at 10 bits, that's a really beautiful high-end uh, 4K video. You can even do 8K and ProRes stuff with this camera. It does a lot of crazy video settings. I just generally shoot 4K, 24 frames per second, 400 megabits per second, 10 bit, uh, right to the memory card. Um, and so those are your, those are those settings. Those are set. Again, your connection to like photos. I don't know why that's there. And then you can dive into the menu or just hit the menu button again. And you can set up your favorites. Set up the favorites the exact same way you set them up for photos in the favorites menu. It's in a different spot in the menu structure, but you can see my favorites here. Gray card, video settings. Video settings have some more things, different things than, than some of the focus settings you had with the camera. You have your microphone gain, which we just had. Whether you've got wind noise reduction turned on or off, I'd rather have that off. You've got some gamma controls. I'm not going to go into what all that is. What photo style you're working with, that's again that standard, vivid, natural like a looks that you download, intelligent dynamic range, that same setting that we talked about, whether it's gonna boost shadows a little bit, and I let the camera make automatic decisions about that. That's gonna count with video, like it does with JPEGs. 
Capture assistance, again, what the grid, zebras, stripes, level, whether your level artificial horizons on or off, histograms on or off, and change all that. So these are all what I have in my favorites. Display settings, same display settings we had for the camera with regard to the EVF and the LCD. You format your memory card. All right, so then we go into the main menu settings. Under focusing, um, you've got those same focus settings that we had with the camera. We don't need to go into those again. You can look at the photo section. Um, you've got your exposure metering, same thing that's in the quick menu. Exposure compensation, if you wanna do that from the menu, I don't know why you would. You can do it with the wheel up here, just like you can in stills mode. ISO, again, that's on a button. Auto ISO settings, again, on a button, lets you set limits, all that kind of stuff. I don't use a lot of auto ISO in video, but I don't want the exposure changing mid-video. White balance, again, we just talked about that. Going into page two, you've got your scene modes. Again, whether you want um, automatic or program aperture shutter and manual, I go program aperture shutter and manual. Optical image stabilization, whether it's on or off, I leave it on. Um, your video format and resolution, we just went through that. That's in my quick. That's in the quick menu. I would never go into the page two to find that. Video settings, we just went through all that. That was in my, that was set to my favorites. The microphone gain and gammon, styles and looks and intelligent dynamic range, all those settings are there again. Customized control, we're about to jump back to here. Um, HDMI with audio, I just leave that turned on. I see no reason to turn it off. It's either on or off. I leave it on so that if you were exporting HDMI, the audio coming into the camera would be there too. Um, you know, if you're gonna use a really high quality mic, uh, with a separate receiver, maybe a wireless mic to a, 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 a nice audio receiver, um, you'd still want the crummy audio that's coming from the mics on the camera to be able to sync those audios in post-production. All right, so here we are on page three, your digital zoom, that's that same frame line thing. You've got user profiles. Those are the same user profiles in video as they are in still. You don't get two different sets. You get two different sets of custom button assignments, but not two different sets of user profiles. I'm not sure totally why. Capture assistance, we just talked about. That was in my favorites menu. Play mode setup, similar thing. Are you grouping? It's the same menu as from stills, same settings. Display settings, same menu as from stills, same settings that they carry over from video to still, the EVF LCD, which one you're using, color and brightness adjustments, and eye sensor sensitivity. The Leica Photos app for pairing to Leica Photos, all that same sort of stuff. You can reset your camera, choose your language. You can see information about the camera and whether your copyright information is coming through. That's still the same menu setting as from stills and all the same information transfers over. You don't have to do it twice. Uh, regulatory and license information is just that built-in stuff. Your, your Mac address firmware version and updates, that's the same as with the stills menu. Um, it's the same menu. Camera settings, same menu. Power saving, acoustic, uh, turning the sound on and off. Carry over, same settings for both. Um, format your memory card, obviously formats it for, for either or. So let's go back to page three. I'm gonna hit the left arrow. And we're gonna go into the, uh, actually it's page two. We're gonna go into customize control. So in a different spot in the video menus. So you can do the same exact thing. You can edit your favorites, you turn off the things you don't want. It's an exclusionary process, just like it was in photography. Same thing with function button one, function button two, center button, thumb wheel button, wheel assignment, auto. It's all the same, but it is a different set of assignments. You assign them in here separately from when you're in the photo mode. This is for the video mode. So what I would do is I'm just gonna show you what I have set up. I have ISO as my main, same as in stills, and auto ISO setting, and optical image stabilization, and intelligent dynamic range. Those are very similar to what I had in my photo shooting menu with the exception of some things that don't make sense in video. All right, function button two, if I long press it, I've got my digital zoom. I can use that to just hit that button and switch from 28 to 35 to 50 to 75 to 90. Um, the focusing menu is accessible here. So if I, I choose the focusing menu and press it, I get that whole deep level focusing menu. For some reason in video, you can't put that in your favorites like I did with stills. I don't know why, just a quirk of the camera. Again, you know, I wanna go back and make sure that I'm still in digital zoom as my default. And touch autofocus, I can change those settings whether it's touch to autofocus or touch to autofocus and start or turn off the touch autofocus, which you might wanna do in video. 
So we're leaving it on digital zoom. I hit that button and it automatically cycles through. Boom. All right, the center wheel. Let's do the center wheel next. If I press and hold it, by default, it's exposure compensation. Uh, it also does gray card if I want to set an auto white balance. I frequently set auto white balance when I'm shooting video because it's baked into the video. It's not into raw photos, but it's baked into video just like it is JPEGs and it's very hard to change later, so you want to get it right. Okay, the center button in the center of your D-pad. I have digital zoom again. I can set it to be here if I wanted to for some reason, but magnification. That's what I like here. So when I'm manually focusing in video, I can, I can say, here's the camera that's actually you guys. And I can set my focus point there, touch that button, zoom in, and then manually focus so that my subject's locked in focus on its mark. Uh, if I press it again, it zooms in six times, boom. So back out, boom, all right? By pressing the shutter button, I get back to the full view. All right, so you can cycle through your magnifications. A Little bit of magnification, a lot of magnification back to full view with the press of the shutter button. Um, so that's how I have my custom button set up. So now that I've done all this customization, both in the um, photo menu as well as in the video menu, which we were just in, let's lock that all into a standard profile, all right? And so when I go in my standard profile, I'll show you what my settings are. I have that intelligent autofocus. It's making a choice about whether a subject's moving or still. I have that field um, autofocus point, the autofocus setting, the area mode, if you were a Nikon type shooter like me, is field, where it's just that square that you move around to pick your subject. That's my general knock around mode. Single frame, I like choosing that decisive moment with this camera, it's the perfect for it. Standard color profile. Um, I use the multi-field. Sometimes if I'm in a situation I notice I'm blowing highlights, I'll switch this over to highlight weighted. That's fine. Um, auto white balance, uh, large DNG, large raw file. Those are my generalized settings. Um, you can see that in the settings I like having my histogram and my, my, um, my level turned on. You know, I can cycle through whether I'm seeing it or not with that center press of a button. My buttons are all assigned and set up. All I need to do once I've got those settings where I want them and the menus are all structured and the controls are all structured is go into my menu and we'll go all the way over to page four where user profiles are and say manage profiles and save as profile and we can save it as standard. All right, I would just click to the right and it says save as user one. This is the user one profile. I would say yes, I'm not gonna overwrite my current one. But boom, now, you know, let's say it, out of, the, out of the gun, if you're doing this yourself, it's gonna be named user one. So if we go to the left, we can rename the profile. We could rename standard. We could backspace out the standard and just type in by touching the touchscreen. I could delete the D and put the D back in and say check mark, I want it to be called standard. So we can name each profile. All right, and that's super handy um, so that when we go in and we change profiles, you can see which one. I'm in, this is the default profile. That's just like you took the camera out of the box. We, we hit the default profile and we lose all of that customization we've done. We long press any of these buttons and you get this list 100 things long to choose from. It just gets onerous. But if we touch our menu and we go into our default standard profile, boom, all of a sudden, now all of our settings are the way that we want them and our buttons are limited to just the functions we want them to function. And it's just a handy way to jump from one shooting mode to another shooting mode that you frequently do. Um, I use profiles constantly with this camera. While you're working with a profile, if you make adjustments to it, if you change the ISO off of auto, if you change the white balance, if you change the maximum ISO for auto ISO, if you do any of those things, the color profile, it's gonna remember it until you leave the profile and come back, and then it'll be just like it was when you saved it. That's the perfect way to do it. If you make changes that you like and you wanna lock them in, all you gotta do is go back to your user profile page, scroll up to get to the bottom or all the way down through them, manage profiles, save as profile, boom. You hit standard and you save over your old one. You can make updates that way. If you do little tweaks that you like and you wanna lock it in, you just go back and save over your old one when you know you're locked in and set up. Now, I would suggest that before you do that, you go in and you go make sure you're in your standard profile and you're set with all your settings the way that you like. Make your little tweaks and changes and then go in there 
and say, now I'm gonna go ahead and save as a profile, save as standard, yes, overwrite, okay? So I have these profiles saved, standard, black and white, landscape and pano, face and eye detect, action, all right? It's really crucial that you set up your standard profile and you have all your button customizations done and your video button customizations done and all your menus set up the way you want before you go in and make the tweaks for the next profile. Otherwise, you're gonna to have to go through and do all of that for each and every profile. It's an insanely long process. If you just do it once and have the buttons all set up the way that you want for photo and the buttons the way you want them set up for video and the menus basically set up the way you want, then it's really easy to tweak just to the way you like the camera for different shooting scenarios. So what I have are my black, I'd standard, we've already seen black and white. All it really does is it changes to black and white natural for the color scape, all right? And it puts me in large JPEG plus large DNG. Like I said, unfortunately, these DNG RAW files that come out of the Leica, when you bring them into Adobe, there's not a profile attached to be able to activate and see the camera's built-in profile rendered on the RAW file. So by shooting the black and white plus JPEG, I get to see the photo the way that Leica rendered it. And I like the way Leica renders it. I can usually get it better by doing black and white adjustments on the RAW file, but sometimes I just work with the large JPEG too because it looks so beautiful out of the camera. And I, it has enough range to boost the shadows a bit as a large JPEG if I need to, or to add contrast. So I like to shoot a JPEG plus RAW file only for black and white images. And then if I go into my third here, it's landscape and panorama. And a few things change here. I'm no longer in auto ISO. I'm at 50 ISO, not auto ISO. I am in single servo focus. I don't want any moving subject tracking. I want it to be locked down once it auto focuses, if I'm even gonna use autofocus. I usually am using manual focus in the landscape with this camera, with it zooming in and peeking to see whether or not I've got razor sharp or not. I am in spot focus, so it's that little tiny point. I pick what I wanna autofocus on if I'm going to autofocus. Uh, I have the grid active on my display, that's really handy for panoramas. When I do panoramas, I tend to flip to vertical, and as I pan, I shoot every time one of those grid line crosses the frame. I want 66% overlap in order to use the center sweet spot of the sensor. The sensor's center is its best part, why not use that for all of the panorama? So if you're curious about panoramas, I have a whole course on my website. You can just click up here or in this video's description to find out more about that panorama course. All right, so that's basically the changes in settings. Oh, the other thing, I go from that, from that multi-field metering to highlight weighted. I want it to be protecting highlights in the frame for landscape work. And, and frequently, I'll jump in and use the, uh, the bracketing if there's a high contrast scene like shooting into a sunset with shadows in the foreground. I'll just fire three frames, three stops apart centered around where I'm metered, maybe with a little exposure compensation depending on the scene, and make sure that I capture all the dynamic range in the scene to blend into one linear raw HDR file to process naturally, but with having all the shadow detail not underexposed and all the highlight detail not overexposed throughout the frame. No artificial line from a graduated filter, it's just money. Um, so then the next one I have is face and eye. This is something I just generally use for portrait subjects. Like I said, I find the face and eye detection slows me down a little bit with getting the shot with moving subject like kids running around, wildlife moving. If I'm shooting a portrait of a stationary human or animal, then it's great. It locks the eyes beautifully. But it, I'd just rather use field or spot or manually focus for moving subjects. I think the field is what I generally love to use. Um, but anyway, it's good, for, it's good for portrait subjects, like I said, if they're working with you and sitting still. And I, I have autofocus continuous selected for that. Otherwise, it's pretty much just the same, you know. Um, so then finally, the last one that I use is action. And for action, I have it set up a little bit differently. I have that tracking 
uh, autofocus point so that if I pick up a subject in the center of the frame, it tracks it all over the frame. I can move, I can move it to where I want in the frame while I'm shooting. Uh, I have it set to auto ISO. I have it set to AFC, not autofocus intelligent. I don't want it to be picking between whether the subject's stationary and locked or tracking. It's going to track. Uh, and I have it set at four frames per second, 14 bit, the highest quality RAW files with autofocus so that it's continuing to autofocus as my subject moves. Um, so, and again, because it's generally people or animals, I have that multi-field metering. I don't care if it blows the highlights a little bit. I really want it to pay, pay attention to the subject that it's tracking. Um, and then I, I have one still in reserve, unused. So if I had some settings that I was using for a particular uh, shoot and I wanted to be able to remember them and get back to them easily, it's like my, my custom sort of whenever, you know, whenever I need it, I can save it. Uh, but right now, I don't have anything in there. It's a, it's a blank spot for, say, I was going to shoot the eclipse, uh, the total eclipse in Mazatlan on my workshop in the uh, spring of next year. And, and I will set up some eclipse custom uh, profile. And the way I'll do it once I get all the settings the way I want for the eclipse is I'll just go into menu again. And there on page four, user profile. I'll go into Manage Profiles at the bottom. I just hit the Up button from the top to get to the bottom quick. And I can save it as a profile. And look at that, User 6 is unused. So I have a sixth profile in my back pocket. And I could rename it Eclipse. And then when I'm done with it, I can delete it. And it's I still have that, that in my back pocket. So those are my Leica settings. Um, I know this video was a little long. If you've stuck with it all the way through, I couldn't appreciate it more. I'll be doing more Leica content. I absolutely adore this camera. Um, it's become an extension of me over this last uh, year of having a Q2 and now the Q3. I think the Q3 is a really nice improvement from the Q2. I don't know that it's 100% necessary. Both cameras have the same, just amazing lens and image rendering. Um, the Q3 just has a little bit more nuanced autofocus, faster handling, and that big juicy 60 megapixel sensor that's even a little bit better in low light somehow, just progress and time marching on. Again, I've got a full review of the things I love about this camera and the things I might even, there are a few nitpicky things I might change along with all of the accessories that I use constantly and feel are just critical for me with this camera. Um, that, you can just watch that video by clicking the link right up at the top of the frame here or go into this video's full description. Um, so I, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. There'll be more Leica content. You'll have to suffer through some Nikon content. You can pick and choose. We also have photo adventures and editing and all kinds of fun stuff. We, really, the user, the, the subscribers to this channel drive the content. Um, so. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, you can download the profiles that I have for this camera. I will export them and I will put those online. You just click the link right here or the one in this description uh, and we will get you that profile. I won't do it for Nikon. For those of you that are Nikon shooters, the camera's just too complicated. The settings that I have with my Z9 and my other Nikons, completely change the way the camera behaves from stock and there is no default profile to jump back to to have it work like it worked out of the box and it doesn't have the manual controls of this camera that make it simpler as you can see the the profiles in this are minute changes and just a, a nuanced way of dealing with too many options with the custom buttons it's 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 not a major change to the way the camera operates out of the box it's just a simplification so uh, for the Nikon shooters out there that might be upset hearing that I'm giving away Leica profiles but not Nikon, there's good reason for it. I don't. I need people to go through the menus and the Nikon and make all the adjustments and changes so they understand each thing. The Leica is simpler. It'll make sense to you. All right. And you can always jump back to the default profile, as I said. So I hope you take some of these things and leave some of these things and go through it and set up the camera yourself and that by walking through all this, it makes a little bit more sense to you the deep level capabilities that this beautiful, wonderful, artistic little piece of metal can do. All right, thanks everybody.